Um, we're going to just start here and I'll just glance over there occasionally to see if it has begun to function or if not, like I said, we're going to have the recording up there. Well, I shared a devotion this morning and I guess I could do that as an announcement too. My devotion this morning was to realize that Al, we are going through a Holy Week like none other before uh, because of this pandemic. We are uh, still in part of what has been one of the most um, meaningful, one of the most packed weeks ever in history. Uh, we call this Holy Week as Christians because a plan that God had set in motion came to its peak in uh, Holy Week, came to its peak on, uh, you know, on Palm Sunday and then Good Friday and all the way to Easter. And the impact of that has been going on now for nearly 2,000 years. Uh, you know, COVID-19 is having a huge impact on us, right? The world has ground to a halt. But in a few months, this is going to pass. And now for the last 2,000 years, what God did in this week in history is something that has reverberated and affected people ever since. And it's great that it happened all packed together in one week, but just like putting together one of these services takes a lot of time, a lot of people, a lot of planning, uh, a lot of things that happen way before the actual moment, God had his plan of salvation set in motion way, way before everything actually happened. And in particular, there's a scripture that I quoted in today's devotion in Genesis, excuse me, in uh, Ephesians chapter one that said before, yeah, you want me to do all of that stuff and everything else, streaming key. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that it's going to work. I guess it's just not going to work. I'm using a secure, da -da, da -da. use a persistent stream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will see if by any, nope, it's just not going to happen. So the live thing's not happening, everybody, sorry. The, uh, back to Ephesians 1, though. Ephesians 1 says, before the creation of the world, God chose us. Uh, the, the creed, the Nicene Creed that we say, begotten of the Father before all worlds. In other words, before God even said, let there be light, he already knew that there was going to be sin. He already knew and planned for his solution to that sin. That's mind-boggling. Whether you think the world's 10,000 years old, 20,000 years old, 20 billion years old, um, that God planned all of this before that is just staggering. That's the degree of his love, his planning, his preparation for us. And I want to explore a little bit of that with you today. So that's what we're going to do, and, and uh, we're just so sorry that this video stuff's not working. I could choose to put it up live on YouTube. I know that they tend to work better than the Facebook folks do. But if I do that, then um, I, have, uh, I, I have already promised I'm going to put it up on YouTube later. So uh, I'm just going to do it here, and I'm going to keep that later promise, and I'm going to stop worrying about it. So... What I'd like to do is we're going to look at a variety of these different prophecies. We're going to start with Genesis chapter 3, and I'm going to invite you to say a prayer with me before we dig into the scripture. Okay, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for loving us so much that you chose us before creation. You planned for our salvation before you ever said, let there be light, before you ever started this world. We ask you to help us come to your word today with hope, to come with your uh, word in believing that you have a plan still going forward, and to come that as we look at this word of what your plan was before, it will strengthen our faith for what your plan is going forward. We pray this in faith in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Okay, so Genesis chapter 3. It might help if I also put this up on the screen for anybody that is watching by video. So you see this little window of Genesis, right? Genesis chapter 3. If you look at the earlier verses, this is where sin first comes into the world. And immediately, God has a solution for that sin that he mentions to Adam and Eve. This is the very first promise 
that he uh, offers, Genesis 3, verse 15. And uh, some people, by the way, have noted that this is um, the, like, Gen like John 3, 16, it's interesting that it's 3, you know, 3 in the middle, 3, 15, almost 3, 16. If you put the two promises together, 15 and 16, it, it works out. But um, you have this promise from God before, you know, within what, five minutes of sin coming into the world? Who knows how long? But uh, immediately. Uh, Genesis 3, verse 15, I will put enmity or fear, or hatred, enmity between you and the woman. He's speaking to the serpent when he says this. Between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Uh, there's more that he mentions about the consequence of sin to Adam and more that he mentions to Eve. But that promise, you know, to the serpent who would cause the problem of sin, to, to Satan himself, God is saying, I, you know, there's going to be, uh, and it says offspring. The real word there is seed would be the, the correct word. And that gets picked up later on. Yes, I know. Oh, goodness. I thought I had done that already. Sorry, that was in the way between your offspring and his, uh, between your seed and her seed. In other words, Satan, you think that you won a battle here, but I'm going to send a descendant through this woman, and that descendant, you're going to wound him. You're going to strike him in the heel. Uh, you definitely wound like Jesus was wounded, but you are going to be crushed. He will crush you under your feet. And we have that promise there in Genesis 3, verse 15. Well, let's look at where that promise gets fulfilled in the New Testament, can we? So jump with me from Genesis 3, 15 to Galatians 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 4. And I'm going to do a couple extra verses just to have something else there on the screen for you. But... Um, Gen Galatians 4, starting at verse 4. So come on there with me and take a look at that. And it says, when the time, set time had fully come. It, Gen Galatians is already pointing out to this. Hey, remember everybody, God had a plan, okay? He had a plan. When the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, like it was promised, born under the law, born to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption. You see that? So God had that plan. When the time came, uh, you know, when everything was in place the way he wanted it to be, he sent his son Jesus to fulfill that promise made way back in the first book of Genesis. And, uh, you know, we might wonder, my goodness, from the time of Genesis until Jesus walked the earth, some scholars would say that might have been 6,000, 10,000 years. We're not entirely sure uh, what, you know, what, what was taking so long, what needed to happen. And from a purely human or historical standpoint, some of the things that happened was there was now a common language in the world. Remember, there had not been a common language since the... Uh, the Tower of Babel, and uh, everyone had been dispersed with their own languages. But now this common language, the language of Greek, was available in the world. Not just the common language, but secondly, this uh, um, sort of mindset of everyone sharing. You know, education was now important. Commerce was important. And uh, this philosophy that the Greeks had of, uh, you know, trying to be uh, rational above just our emotions and so on. All these things were so common over uh, an area that included millions and millions of people. Um, then, on top of that, now you have one new empire who is stronger than the Greeks ever were, the Roman Empire, who unites all of it, who now brings it under a bond of a common law, who brings it with common uh, currency, who adds roads for uh, safe travel of education and commerce, and also armies to conquer others, which is why they had it. It's sort of like the interstate system in the United States, that once these things were put in place, businesses really took off, travel and tourism really took off. And in the same way, God seems to have arranged and put all these things into place, so that now, very quickly, a birth in 
Bethlehem and a death of a savior in Jerusalem could spread a faith of that to a, a, a population of folks that's estimated to be 300 million people. Now that doesn't sound like a lot maybe today in a world where we have 7 billion plus, but back then, if you think of what 3 billion people meant in the year you know, 30 AD, that was a vast majority of the people living on the planet at that time. And so it was an opportunity to very quickly spread this gospel news. A promise made in Genesis, fulfilled in Galatians. We, we have that. Let's, let's take a look at another one. I want to take you to a little uh, book in the Old Testament, the prophets, that you might not go to that often, but it's Micah chapter 5, M-A-C-H-A-A, -A, if I'm spelling it right. I don't know if I'm, how am I spelling Micah? M-I-C-A-H, that works better, M-I-C-A-H 5. And Micah chapter, I still did it wrong. Micah chapter 5. Micah is right after Jonah, if that helps anybody find him, uh, in the little tiny prophets. But a ruler promised from Bethlehem is what the text says in Micah chapter 5. Let me put that up on the screen for anybody that's watching by video. Micah chapter 5, it says in verse 2, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Well, here is a prophecy made maybe 500, uh, 600 years before the birth of Jesus. And the, um, the promise is being made where this Messiah is going to come from, where this king is going to come from, is Bethlehem. And it makes some sense. That's the city of David. It's where David came from. So if David was one of the, not the first, but certainly the most influential king in the history of Israel, that God would choose to have his king of kings come from the same place, from Bethlehem, from David's uh, town. But it's also interesting uh, in a couple of different layers that um, God is choosing from one of the smallest clans. Uh, God often, as uh, we see in the New Testament, he says that God chooses the small things and the weak things and the things that are, are almost disregarded by the world, and he chooses those to be the most influential. There's a place in several times in the New Testament where it says that God chose uh, Christ to be the cornerstone, and it points out that the one that's rejected is actually the foundation stone of all. Uh, so it's, it's just interesting that that dynamic exists with God, that he would do that. And we see this promise fulfilled. Here's a passage a lot easier to find in Matthew chapter 2. So take a look at Matthew chapter 2. And uh, we'll put that up on the screen for everybody. Matthew chapter 2 is uh, the place where King Herod is visited by the wise men. And these wise men or magi come from the east and they go, well, where's the king that was born king of the Jews? Herod was not a, a born king of the Jews. He really kind of uh, shoehorned his way into that position. That's a longer lesson than I can talk about today. But when King Herod is going, well, wait a minute, what are they talking about? He gathers together his advisors, his chief priests and teachers of the law, and he asks them where the Messiah or the king is supposed to be born. And they reply, quoting from the passage we just looked at, well, he's going to come from Bethlehem. Uh, and uh, that's the, the promise God made uh, those years ago through the prophet uh, Micah. And now it, um, they'll keep that true. So uh, this is only six miles or so from Jerusalem. It's not a very long journey at all. Um, it feels actually like it's part of Jerusalem today, um, is, as big as cities are. Uh, so it, it's uh, very uh, connected in that aspect. But it would have been a little bit of a walk from, from the Jerusalem of that time. And that's a promise that was made, and God kept it. Um, the theme, I guess, I'm trying to go with this as we work it through is that God's a promise maker and God's a promise keeper. And you can look, the, there are estimates that there's over a thousand promises in the Bible. 
We're looking specifically at the ones that have to do with the promise of Jesus coming into the world and then how and where that was fulfilled. There are more than 30 of these. We're just going to do a few here today. But uh, part of the point is to be amazed again at this Holy Week and all the planning that God had put in place, all the, the clues and the hints he gave and how um, uh, you know amazing that is. Another plan is to be amazed that uh, someone who is a lot better at math than I am has estimated the likelihood of any one person fulfilling all of these promises in the Bible, these 35, 37 promises, is like uh, a one in uh, a 10 to the 37th power. It's a, a huge number. And uh, they just said it's uh, it, it just so unlikely that uh, there could have been any one person, and yet that's the one God chose. And I guess a, a third factor, maybe more modern and contemporary to us today, is the idea that a God who makes promises in his Bible is a God who's going to keep those promises to you. So when he promises, for example, in Matthew chapter 28, lo, I am with you always, that's a promise he's going to keep. When he says in another place in Philippians 4 that uh, he will guard your heart and your mind with a peace that passes all understanding. When, when we can't understand everything that's going on with COVID-19, when, when we can't even comprehend how many people have died and what they're saying these next two weeks are going to be like, God, uh, with you know, when we can't understand why and we can't get over the pain in our heart, God comes with a peace. So that's a promise he made there. And as we look at all of these promises, we have the chance to realize that God's a promise keeper, promise maker, and a promise keeper. And that's that's the whole really the whole point uh, of this today. Before I move us to our next gospel promise and prophecy, let me unmute folks and see if anybody has a comment they want to share. So microphones going on now. Anyone have anything they want to share or add? Any comments or thoughts? Yeah, all I can say is just wonderful uh, that it's so hard for us to understand everything, but it's there clear in the Bible, you know, and you're telling us all the places that it is. Um, so it's wonderful that God is such a loving God. Indeed. Anyone else? Okay. Well, I want to invite you now uh, to jump with me to Isaiah. This one ought to be a little easier to find. Isaiah is one of the bigger books in the Old Testament. It's after the, right after or shortly after Psalms. Take a look at Isaiah chapter 7. And um, I, as you're getting to Isaiah 7, just a couple of thoughts about Isaiah. Isaiah is sometimes called the Shakespeare of the Old Testament. And I probably ought to do a Bible study at Gethsemane on just Isaiah, because there are so many rich passages there, uh, so many uh, rich images. And um, he, it seems, I guess I might say, of, of all the prophets, of all the people that God gave little hints and clues to of what he was going to do in the future, Isaiah seems to have some of the most uh, tantalizing ones. Uh, and Isaiah has some other very interesting, I almost want to call them mysterious factors to it. For example, Isaiah has 66 chapters. There are 66 books in the whole Bible. Uh, the Old Testament has 39 books. The New Testament has whatever the other balance is, 26. I, I lose track of what I just said. Uh, sorry. But um, there's a very clear break in Isaiah, a shift in the tone, and it hits at that 39th book. Uh, so from chapter 40 forward, it's very different in its tone. And uh, so it's just fascinating that God seems almost in this one book of Isaiah to have given us uh, almost a little, a little mini Bible right here of the whole story. Now, let's take a look specifically now at Isaiah chapter 7. Get it on the screen for you. And here is a passage where Isaiah goes and talks to Uzziah. Uh, who is king in Judah at the time. And they are surrounded by an army uh, from Aram that has marched up against them. They've surrounded the city of Jerusalem, and everybody's terrified. They're all worried about uh, this. And it says in verse uh, 2, 
that their uh, hearts were shaken as trees of the forest that are shaken by the wind. So they're, these people are quaking in their boots, in, in other words. And um, Isaiah is, comes to the king and he says, you know what? It is not going to happen. He says in verse 9, if you do not stand in your faith, you will not stand at all. So I need you to stand firm. And the Lord even says to the king, hey, ask me. And I will, uh, the Lord your God, ask me for a sign. And I will show you that this is really true, that, that I'm going to protect you from this invading army. And Isaiah, Ahaz says, oh, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. That's in verse uh, 12. Interesting. You know, it's true. It does say, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. How, however, when God invites you to put him to the test, he's saying, you know what? Yes, that's my general command. That's generally true. But I'm offering this to you as a strength for your faith. So um, uh, Ahaz says that, and God, through Isaiah, has a response. Uh, and his response is, you know what? You didn't ask me for a sign. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a sign. I'll tell you what the test is. And the sign, you can see it in Isaiah 7, verse 14. Let me highlight that for you. The Lord himself will give you a sign, Isaiah 7, 14 says. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. And that word Emmanuel, uh, many of us as Christians know, means God with us. So a very unusual birth is going to take place. I didn't share that, did I? Let's try that again. I didn't even put that up there. So there it is. There's the verse. God will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. You will call him Emmanuel. That's an unusual sign, right? That would get your attention. It's not happened before. The normal way that children come into this world is a procreation between a man and a woman. But God is saying, I'm going to do something very special. That this one who is to be born, this special gift that I'm going to send who will set things right, he is going to be born in an unusual way, that there will not be normal procreation. It will be a special, unique gift from God, and that's why you're going to call him God with us. God is going to come and in some way through this virgin be born as God with us, uh, and it's just fascinating. This is some 600 years before Jesus was ever born that Isaiah got this image, this picture from God of what was going to happen. Well, you know, it was fulfilled. We were in Matthew a little while ago in Matthew chapter 2. Why don't we jump over to Matthew chapter 1 and see the fulfillment of this? I will work on getting that on the screen for you, hopefully a little faster this time and not miss it. We have this long genealogy. That's a Bible study in and of itself. But we want to get down to a verse uh, here at chapter 18, sorry, chapter 1 of Matthew, verse 18 and following. And we'll take a look at that. So here is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married, but before they ever came together for that normal, pro normal procreation, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now, Joseph, you know, I'm sure he could listen to Mary's story and about the angel and about the Holy Spirit coming upon her and all that and go, well, that's never happened before. And you can understand why he might have in mind to divorce her quietly uh, and, and be done with someone because this has just never happened in history. But he is, he's thinking about this, has a, a vision from an angel himself. That's in verse 20 and uh, through 21. And now verse 22 brings the whole story home, and it quotes that passage from Isaiah. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had promised, to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So God made this great promise and he kept it. It took, you know, some 600 years, but then again, he made uh, this plan some thousands or uh, millions of years uh, before, 
and he set it all into place. God is a promise maker and a promise keeper. There is certainly the promise of the, uh, the children of Bethlehem being slaughtered by Herod. As I said, there are some 35 of these. I'm not going to, uh, to do all of them, but I do want to look at some that talk about the, um, the, get into the events that have to do with Holy Week. So for the next one, I'd like to take you to Zechariah 9, verse 9. Zechariah, one of the last of the Old Testament prophets. Zechariah 9, verse 9. And share the screen. There it is. Zechariah 9, verse 9. This is the prophecy of how Palm Sunday would go. So, uh, now this is some 450 or so years before Jesus ever came. And this promise made of how this king would come, how he would arrive, this Messiah would come. It says, see your king comes to you righteous and victorious, although lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, Think of how you might imagine a conquering king to ever show up. You would expect, and this was certainly uh, in the Roman times, if a, a king or a general had won a battle, he would ride in a great parade into the city. He'd be in, you know, pulled by beautiful white horses, pulling his fantastic chariot. Usually some of the slaves or the prisoners of war would have gone before him all in shackles and chains bowed down, the crowd would have, you know, boo to all of you, and then they would have cheered the soldiers to follow, and their biggest cheer of all would have been for this uh, emperor or for this general riding, either riding on a white horse or riding in a chariot pulled by a white horse. Uh, David, when he wanted to come as king, chose instead of riding on a white horse, uh, or, you know, in modern times, you know, you can almost picture Patton showing up for something, riding on a tank, right? David, when he wanted to show the people of Israel his heart and his character, did not choose to come on a white horse, but he rode around on a donkey. It was his way of saying, I'm humble, and yet I am here to be a servant king. Well, Jesus, the son of David, takes on that same imagery and grabs that same idea that was God is bringing together the humility of him coming, but also the power that's there. I'm not going to intimidate anybody. I'm not going to force anyone to bow down and worship me. I am going to, by my acts of love and my, especially my act of sacrifice, I'm going to come and let the power of that love and the power of my gestures speak for me instead of awing people with armies and uh, all these other things. So that is the path that he chose. And we can see that fulfilled if we jump into our New Testament, right? We can spot that getting fulfilled in John chapter 12. I know we could go to Luke where the today's gospel reading was from, but why don't we try John 12? And uh, here he comes as, as the... Uh, Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king, and I'll share that screen with everyone. I hope these clicks of my mouse aren't too irritating for folks who are listening by phone as we uh, pull this up for people who are watching this uh, with us or watching later. And uh, the, uh, the promise here as this great crowd comes, as they take their palm branches in John 12, verse 12, is the crowd goes out to Jesus shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written. Uh, you may know from the other Gospels that Jesus even told his disciples, hey, you're going to find the donkey. Go ahead, find it. If anybody asks you why you're untying it and taking their donkey, so you say this, the Lord has need of it, and they're going to let you go. Um, and that's just even amazing in and of itself. I don't think that if I came up to your driveway right now and was uh, taking your car, and you go, what are you doing taking my car? And I said to you, well, the Lord has need of it. Maybe you'd give me the benefit of the doubt because I'm your pastor, 
But I have a feeling that you might find that a little strange, right? A stranger will come up saying, the Lord has need of it. Somehow, some way, God to put it on those people's heart to be ready to not hold on tightly and to let that donkey go and serve that purpose. But the larger image again in here is God's a planner, God's a promise maker, God's a promise keeper. And so we're looking at these promises now of the events that take place in uh, Holy Week. How about the book of Psalms? Can we take a look there and go to Psalm 41? Psalm 41, verse 9 in particular. Psalm 41, verse 9 is going to talk about Jesus' betrayal. And uh, we'll share that on the screen with you. Psalm 41, verse 9, even my closest friend, someone I trusted who shared my bread, has turned against me. David wrote that, and David had that as an experience in his life, but it was also, if you will, uh, a shadow. It was a hint. It was an echo of what was going to come for the ultimate betrayal, which we understand is what Judas does with Jesus later on. And, and we can see that uh, in uh, the Gospel of John uh, uh, 13 is one place where it's mentioned. But I think uh, for right now, why don't we go to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, verse 10. And I think I'll pull up the context to show a little bit more of that. Mark 14, uh, we see that Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus. So he's one of Jesus' dear friends, one of his, his inner circle of the 12 disciples. And he goes and, and does that. And he, even then, if you come down to verse 20, after Jesus had said, you know, uh, there's going to be someone who betrays me, um, Jesus then also, when he's asked, well, who's going to do it? And his disciples say, he replies to his disciples in verse 20, Mark, uh, tw Mark 14, verse 20. It is one of the 12, one who dips bread in the bowl with me. And the Son of Man will go just as it was written about him. So Jesus is, for anybody that has ever thought, you know, oh, poor Jesus. He was a sweet guy. He was a nice teacher. Uh, he didn't intend for this to happen. He just sort of you know, got in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he got crucified. Farthest thing from the truth. This was a plan that the Father had from uh, centuries, millennia, uh, eons ago, and it was planned, and Jesus knew it, which is why one reason why he was so calm, even as it was all happening. So betrayed by a friend, uh, there is a prophecy. We were in, in Zechariah earlier, how about we take a look? There's two of them in Zechariah that we can look at. We can look at Zechariah 11. So Zechariah 11 is going to contain two more. Uh, even though this is a fairly small book, it's got a lot of these prophecies packed into it as well. Zechariah 11, and we will start, why don't we look at verse 12 first? And uh, we'll look at 12 and 13. Zechariah 11, 12 and 13. So here is this talk about, um, you know, you will, they pay me 30 pieces of silver. And uh, then verse 13, the Lord said to me, oh, throw it to the potter. What a handsome price than which they valued me. In other words, God, in, in this, uh, this kind of fascinating and, and way that probably was not really understood by the people in Zechariah's day, God was priced or God was valued by these people as being worth 30 pieces of silver. And then God says, throw it back. You know, if that's all they're going to value me for, throw it back to the potter. And they threw it to the potter at the house of the Lord. Well, if you remember... That's exactly what and Judas ends up doing. He betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And uh, we can see that in 
the Gospel of um, Matthew. Matthew verse 26 is where we'll jump from there. So, uh, sold me for 30 pieces of silver, but threw it to the potter's house, Zechariah tells us. Let's go to Matthew 26 now. And in Matthew 26, G Judas agrees to betray Jesus. Again, we'll show that on the screen if it'll let me. Oh, it already is. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, it's already showing that. He agrees to betray, so they counted him out 30 pieces of silver. And uh, then the whole betrayal and everything happens. If you uh, jump ahead now to the next chapter, to chapter 27, Judas uh, feels remorse for what he did, that he handed him over. I've sinned, he says in verse uh, chapter 27, verse 4. I've betrayed innocent blood. And uh, so they, uh, he throws the money back at the temple, which is in keeping with the, uh, the prophecy that was there. And... This is uh, then now at verse Matthew 27, verses 6. The priests go, well, we can't use that money. It was uh, against blood. We can't put it into the treasury. So they buy a, a potter's field, a place to, bore, to bury the poor or the foreigners. And um, that is to fulfill a promise made by Jeremiah and Zechariah. They took the pieces of silver and they bought the potter's field. And that other, uh, so the same place, uh, that we looked at in Zechariah is also mentioned in Jeremiah, and that Jeremiah scripture is Jeremiah 19 uh, and also in Jeremiah 32. But we're going to just stick with the Zechariah one here for, uh, for today. So we've got his, um, the betrayer, we've got the 30, um, the, uh, you know, the 30 pieces of silver and then the, the potter's field. How about we now look at the kind of things that start to happen on, uh, on Maundy Thursday and then into Good Friday. Why don't we look at Psalm 27, Psalm 27, and look at the people that are going to make the accusations against Jesus. Psalm 27, verse 12 in particular. Psalm 27, verse 12. They are going to, it says there, do not... Turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. And this uh, betrayal that takes place is also uh, going to be mentioned in great detail in another psalm, Psalm 22, that you might be familiar with. It's a psalm that Jesus quotes from the cross. We'll get to that one in a little while. But why don't we look at where this... Uh, actually takes place of the false witnesses and the, uh, the false accusations. Let's turn now and take a look at where that takes place in Matthew chapter 26. So we're doing a lot of bouncing here from Old Testament to New Testament, from where the gospel or where the promise was first made, the prophecy was first made, and then where it's fulfilled. But in Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus is arrested, we're down at verse 60 and 61. They kept, uh, it says in Matthew 26, verses 60 and 61, they kept trying to get witnesses to come and speak against Jesus. And those witnesses, pop that up on the screen for you. Those witnesses, they couldn't find anyone to agree. Uh, you know, in, in Old Testament justice, you had to have two or three people that could agree on what an accusation was before someone could actually be sentenced. And they tried to bring uh, false evidence against Jesus. They couldn't find anybody. And finally, they got two people together who declared, verse 61, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Uh, you know, it's kind of silly and sad that that's all they could come up with. Uh, someone that had done so much healing, so much teaching, so much good. It's not surprising, I guess, in one level that they couldn't find it. But um, it, it is just a, a proof, for example, how hard they were trying. We've got to find something to stop this guy because uh, we don't believe what he's teaching. And we think he's going to ruin uh, what, uh, what we understand to be what God is doing. 
It's so interesting that what they understood to be the way God worked was so opposite of what his actual plan was. And that's probably a good lesson for us here and today. We would wonder why disease, why, you know, why this pandemic? And we do not understand why this is what God is doing. But as I mentioned in a, a message a few weeks ago, God has in mind what he's going to do. He already has a plan. And uh, I wouldn't think that this plague was really his plan per se, but he has a plan for the good that he's going to do in and through this plague. Uh, just to uh, try to bring that into you know the current situation. Let me stop here. Let me offer anybody comments, thoughts, or questions. Uh, the mics are open if anybody wants to uh, jump in and ask anything. You sure tested us on going through the Bible today. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, Johnny. We are going through it, and uh, wow, we, oh, I did not realize how late it was. That's okay. I did not realize that. How about, let's look at the last, uh, the last one of these. There are several bundled together in Isaiah chapter 53, and we'll, we'll close with those because uh, we're, we're going to run out of time. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, I will put it up on the screen. This is uh, perhaps one of the most amazing pictures uh, describing what the suffering of Jesus was going to be like. And there are several things mentioned uh, in there that I think are worth us noting. Um, one of them is that the suffering of Jesus wasn't just suffering for himself. In fact, he hadn't done anything wrong, but it was suffering that was of benefit to us. The fancy word for that is vicarious, right? We get the benefit of what he suffered on our behalf. And that is described in Isaiah 53 verses 4, 5, and 6. And I'd like to offer to read those to you. Isaiah 53 verses 4, 5, and 6 Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. In other words, the people seeing it at the time are thinking this is a punishment from God. When in fact, as verse 5 goes on, he was pierced for our transgressions. He isn't being punished by God because of anything he did. He's taking the punishment for us that we deserve. Isaiah 53 verse 5 goes on, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep had gone astray, each of us had turned to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So these are, uh, you know, amazing descriptions of what was taking place at the cross, that Jesus was suffering on our behalf, that he was going through all of that. And there are a couple of places in the New Testament that mention that. I'm, I'm only going to take you to one of them. But one of them that mentions it is one time when Jesus was driving out demons from the, the sick, it points out in Matthew 8, that this was to fulfill the word that he had healed the sick and it was fulfilled the prophecy. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. But a place I would prefer to take you is Romans 4, verse 25. Romans 4, verse 25. Get that ready. And we'll share it. Romans 4, verse 25 says that he, Jesus, was delivered over to death for our sins, just like Isaiah talked about, and then he was raised again for our justification. So these are, are just an example, and as I mentioned, there are just pages and pages of these um, that his, he would be praying for his enemies was prophesied, that he would be given gall and vinegar to drink while he was on the cross was prophesied, 
that his side would be pierced was prophesied in Zechariah, that soldiers would gamble for his clothes, that his bones would not be broken. All of these promises made because God was showing us in this crucifixion of Jesus a picture or a fulfillment of these things that he had planned long ago and he had prophesied and promised long ago. He's now showing the fulfillment of that. Uh, and all of it, even including the resurrection, was all promised. So God's still a promise keeper. God is still one who is going to keep promises for you and me today. And we can hold on to that, especially in these uncertain times. As we get ready to wrap up, uh, I want to uh, offer out to anyone that I'll keep the line open here. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll uh, stop the recording of this that we'll put on Facebook and YouTube live. I'll stop that here in a moment, but I'll keep the line open for any discussion, any personal prayers that you might want to offer. But I want to especially invite you to be a part of our Maundy Thursday and Good Friday services here online uh, at 7 p.m. both days, as well as Easter Sunday to take place at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday, April 12th. All right, let's offer up a prayer and then we will wrap up for today. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and for your love. We are amazed at how much you love us that you who created this world had a plan to save us and make us your children even before you created the world. God, you are a planner. You are a lover of our souls. You are our savior and you are worthy of our praise for all that you planned, all that you promised and all the promises that you kept through the life, the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of our Savior Jesus. So remind us of your promises today in all that we go through. And would you be glorified as you then strengthen our faith and help us live in courage and compassion and love as well. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, everybody, wash your hands. This next two weeks is going to be our biggest challenge and our probably the biggest time when the people of God need to pray. But may God bless you and keep you through it all. Amen.